in the movies, um, which is a talk about our exploit framework that we've been working on. Um, let's just start introductions. Uh, so who we are, I am Spoon M, and uh, I'm an independent researcher. Uh, for a quarter of the year, I'm a security consultant, and for the rest of it, I'm a student. And, uh, yeah. Uh, my name is H.D. Moore. I work for a company called Digital Defense. We provide risk assessment services. Um, we both work on Metasploit and kind of whatever free time we happen to have. Um, this talk is about exploit frameworks in general, um, new exploit technology, pretty much saying that all the things that you've seen on TV in the last 10 years that show, you know, people flying through cyberspace and, you know, hacking Gibsons and all that silly stuff, you can actually almost do today. It's pretty amazing. So we're going to talk about um, some of the current capabilities of exploit frameworks, uh, touch on core impact, Canvas, uh, some of the products out there, and also give you an idea of what you can do with the recently released version 2.2 of the Metasploit framework. So, and I'm sure what everyone's looking for is actually seeing the VNC shellcode work. Uh, if anyone has a wireless connection right now, you can actually download a copy of our code. It's metasploit.com slash bh. So we actually uploaded it as of 20 minutes ago. So feel free to grab a copy and play it during the talk if you like. Uh, slides are also up on that same website, uh, metasploit.com slash bh, if you want to follow along. Um, and we have both the uh, Windows installer up there and the Unix builds. Um, that's our pre-2.2 release. Um, we hope to have a 2.2 release out in like a week or two. But this is the uh, Vegas edition, um, <laughs> complete with drunken coding. So <laughs> hopefully it works. So uh, just starting off with a brief history of uh, exploit frameworks. We weren't the first people around, um, for sure. So we'll uh, kind of give a history of um, things to date, uh, sans exploit. So what is an exploit framework? Um, we're going to try to rush through this first part of the talk, mostly because we're only 75 minutes, and I'm sure you guys would rather see interesting stuff versus background information. Um, an exploit framework is just an interface for launching exploit code. Essentially, any system that can take you know, multiple exploits, put them into a consistent interface, and launch them can be considered an exploit framework. Uh, most exploit modules have to be standardized for that to work. And it usually includes like, you know, reliable shellcode, payloads, encoders, that whole set to actually be able to reliably you know, execute exploits with arbitrary payloads. Uh, common routines and a lot of professional features, such as pen testing features like you know, full session logging or you know, attack pivoting, things like that. Okay, so uh, you know what problem did an exploit framework solve? Um, Eighty percent of code out there right now. I don't know if you follow like PacketStorm and BugTrack and stuff. A lot of it's just very boilerplate, like you know enough to pop a box, but you know not very extensive, not very robust. Um, payloads usually hard coded. Advanced techniques are rarely used. Usually it's just enough to actually get it working on like you know the one developer system and get their name on BugTrack. Um, most you know vulnerability uh, exploit coders aren't real programmers. Um, not that we are, but um, and so I mean the code the code shows. Um, and nobody really is going out there and posting code for old bugs and also applying new techniques and new payloads to you know an exploit maybe two years ago. So it's not like anybody's going to go and revamp you know some three-year-old DNS exploit with VNC payloads um, just because I mean people aren't doing that. Kind of the other side of that is though, even though people aren't writing codes for you know writing new exploits for older vulnerabilities, you actually need them when you're doing penetration testing. Um, as anyone in the room is probably familiar with, if you're trying to exploit an old you know TSEG bug, and the version you're attacking is a different version of the operating system, or it's on a different you know whatever it happens to be, a lot of times you actually have a real use for an older vulnerability, and you know an exploit framework tends to try to fill in all the holes and all the available bugs. Um, there's two public. I'm sorry about that. There's uh, two public exploit frameworks out right now that were. Or, excuse me. Out of the public exploit frameworks, there's two commercial projects. These are Core Impact and Mini Canvas. We'll go into a little you know, brief description of each in the next slide. Um, there's also Metasploit Framework, and we're aware of about two or three other projects on the side that are being developed as open source projects. And they're all over the map as far as what they provide, what they do, et cetera. As the open source project goes, we're the real, I think, only open source exploit framework. There's other things that are like payload systems and some things that kind of look like they may, in the future, um, kind of lead more towards an exploit framework. Um, so a uh, quick overview of Core Impact, which is written by uh, Core Secu Security Technologies. Um, it was the first real exploit framework. It's been around since like 2000. Um, 
really smart guys working on this. Uh, it's pricey, but it's extremely complete, uh, very well developed. It's written in uh, Python and C++, and their, uh, their interface only runs on Windows, uh, but of course it can exploit anything, and they have agents that run on you know, uh, pretty much all platforms. Uh, one of their main features is you can pivot through own boxes, where if you own a box in the perimeter, then you can then own from that box. Um, and they, they do that with a, sys a syscall proxying payload system. Um, and that's how they do all of their advanced file upload, download, proxying. Um, and so they've been doing that, they've been doing syscall proxying for a while, and they've had this technology and they've really gotten good at it. I apologize for the bumps every time we change mics. We're still hoping that second one shows up sometime, so. Okay, cool, thanks. Bear with us. The second commercial product is called is Immunity Canvas. Um, this product came out in, I think, early 2000, or late 2001, early 2002. It's designed to run on any platform that supports Python and um, the GTK toolkit. So right now it supports you know Windows and uh, Red Hat Linux. Uh, supports some limited syscall, pro uh, limited syscall proxying. It has a decent set of exploits, somewhere around 60 or 70 last time we checked. Um, it may actually do uh, attack pivoting in the near future, but it doesn't do it right now. It's less expensive or less extensive than impact, but it's also about fourteen thousand dollars cheaper. So, yeah, um, I'll just go ahead. And, sorry, I was distracted by the potential for another microphone. Um, Current capabilities, um, they're pretty much all the exploit. We've basically got it down to point, click, and root, um, and that's. <laughs> That's what we do, and that's what they do too. So um, we also can do things like pivoting through own boxes, um, automatic payload encoding to avoid bad characters and stuff like that, which is more of the exploit development side. Um, and also, both of the current systems have dynamic shellcode generation. Um, Impact uses inline egg, uh, which is a Python-based system, and uh, uh, Canvas uses MoStef, which is also a Python-based system that allows you to write um, your payloads and dynamically compile them down to, to um, assembly. The next section is the Metasploit framework. We're just going to kind of give you a background about what the tool is, what you can do with it right now, and kind of where we're going with it. Um, again, we're hoping to get through the first couple sections fairly quickly, so if you have any questions about the stuff, feel free to come up to us afterwards and ask us about it. Uh, what we're really trying to focus on is exploit technology and not so much our tool today, so hopefully once we get to that section, we can talk at length and kind of do questions and answers and demos as we go. Okay. I don't like Sweet. So. So quick introduction, uh, Metasploit Framework is an open source exploit framework. Um, it's also an exploit development platform. We actually think of it more as a tool for developing exploits and testing technologies than we do for an actually day-to-day -day exploit tool. Um, a lot of the way that we designed it was more from an engineer's perspective than the end user, and it's probably apparent when you start running the console interface, but we still think it's fairly intuitive. Um, unlike everyone else on the planet, we actually use Perl instead of Python to write our exploit framework. So I know we've had maybe, what, 50 people tell us in the last year that switch to Python, switch to Python, and it's like, yeah. no. <laughs> Why should we? <laughs> we have it working now, so. Well, and one cool thing about that is using Perl, like, we can extract it, the framework on, like, you know, a stock HBox box. It runs fine, runs on Solaris. Um, all, like, you know, Perl has been stock for a lot longer than Python has. And uh, I guess that could be a really important thing, is having a more portable exploit framework than, a, than something like a GUI-driven Windows 32-only thing. Um, so history, um, it originally started out as HD's network game. Um, don't be on his network, I guess. Um, so it was rewritten for uh, professional use, um, for pen testing tasks and stuff like that. Rather into an open source project. Uh, and right now we have uh, four primary developers. We have two uh, primary framework developers, which is us. And then we also have uh, two guys that have been doing a lot of work uh, on like the payload systems, um, a lot of other very important um, pieces of the framework. So uh, and we have a handful of other people who have contributed uh, pieces of code. Right now we have about me, right now we have about 35 exploits in the public version of the framework. That's the URL on your um, slides. About 40 different payloads. Um, what you see in most other exploit frameworks is that every single, and if you want to use any exploit, you're restricted to either using their syscall proxying system or some other somewhat hard-coded payload type. In other words, if you want to you know, exploit the LSA's S bug, you have to use a bind shell, you have to use a reverse connect shell, or you have to use a syscall pro proxying mechanism inside you know, core impact or whatever we happen to be using to exploit the bug. Uh, we believe that you should be able to develop, write, and install your own you know, payloads and be able to use them with any exploit. 
what that's done as far as the design of it framework is that we've had to make sure that no matter what payload you provide, it'll still work with exploit code. Then this is kind of a, uh, a, technolo a technological advance no one else really had to do because they've only geared their systems to work with their specific, you know, custom payloads like the syscall proxying systems. Um, we've got a stable exploit and payload API right now, and the tool is currently being used by um, almost every security firm we've talked to has either played with it, tried it, or plans on doing something with it in the near future. Um, we're seeing more use by system administrators. People will go through and run Nessus on the network and then decide, hey, you know, is this actually vulnerable? Did Nessus actually detect this correctly? And then following up their vulnerability scans with an actual exploit. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Metasploit 2.2 is the first dev friendly release, uh, meaning we uh, pretty much firmed um, the API between 2.1 and 2.0. There wasn't a lot of changes. And uh, also, we put some docs and some sample modules and stuff out there. Obviously, all of our modules right now are just sitting there. It's a really easy design. You know, you go to the exploit directory, and there's like 10 modules. You can just look at them all, and it's very right out there. Um, and adding one is just a matter of sticking the file in the directory. Um, but we, we did write like a tutorial and sort of walk through the different steps and the different pieces of um, writing an exploit from the framework perspective. So uh, the components of the, of the Metasploit framework um, we have user interfaces, which we right now have uh, three released ones, and uh, they're, they're um, very simple to write. And we have a, uh, a command line interface, a uh, read line console interface, and a web interface. We'll talk more about those later. Um, the, other, the other components um, are exploits, obviously. Um, encoders, which are responsible for encoding the, uh, the payloads. And we have payloads, and as part of the payloads, we have the payload handlers, which do things like you know the, the post um, payload run socket stuff usually. Um, and we have NOP generators. Quick thing on the handler stuff. Um, a lot of times you'll see new payload techniques being developed and released. Um, for instance, you'll see like LSD release the Windows assembly components and there's a really nice framework for being able to do kind of being able to do like, you know, uploads, downloads, file execution, a lot of like, you know, multi multitask payloads through a single exploit. The problem with that is it requires you to write your own client API for all those different functions. Every time that you wanted to upload a file, well you had to write a handler on the client side of your exploit code to handle that for you. What we've done is we've abstracted the code that actually handles the payloads. So no matter what payload you're using and whatever exploit you choose, the handler for that payload is actually built into it. So, for instance, this is like a, a multi-staged, uh, you know, one-third two loader payload. Where the first connection that comes back, it sends another chunk. That chunk comes back. That sends a length value that gets XORed by something else. Yada yada goes six levels deep. It does it all for you, in other words. So, by building the payload handlers, it's kind of building them into the payloads themselves. It allows you to do, you know, arbitrarily complex payloads without having to make the user do anything weird on their side, like set up 20 netcat listeners or socks proxies or anything silly like that. Yeah, another cool thing about the handler design is just the, uh, the way it's uh, laid out in code. Um, it's really easy to do simple and cool things like, for example, our XOR shells. You just override like two methods, do the XORs, and you just do it in your payload. You add like little, you know, sub functions that do it. Very, very simple, um, really clean, and then you, I mean, you can do XOR in like six lines. So that's pretty cool. Um, so about these interfaces, we have MS Console, uh, which is the tab completion, and this is the uh, supported um, user interface. This is what we use, and if you have problems with like MSF Web, uh, bummer. So, um, so this, so this is, so this does tab completion. It does. Um, it's, it feels very much like a Unix environment. Um, you can run commands inside of the uh, inside of the console. You, I mean, there's an environment, and you have access to everything. Um, you know, you can hit up stuff like that. So that's kind of cool. Um, MSCLI is the uh, the command line interface. Um, which is the same as the console, just minus the console. Um, so you just give all the options on the command line, and it does the same thing. MSF Web is our proof of concept, flashy demo interface, which is uh, driven as a web server, and you can just go in a web browser and go through and set up all your options and uh, exploit from the browser. Um, and it's really, really simple to add new interfaces, um, the way things are laid out. I wrote uh, Metabot, which was the uh, board IRC bot of the day. Um, it was 86 lines, so uh, we now have a, uh, a Metasploit client roaming around on our IRC network. Um, and then, you know, it was really simple. I just tell it to come into a channel, it comes up, gives you the splash screen, and you say, like, Metabot, you know, exploit. And it says, okay, and gives you back the response, and gives you the shell, and all the handlers still work, and all of that stuff. And so it's actually pretty cool. 
Okay. Kind of the point of it is that we've abstracted the user interface components of exploit design to the point that you can write any kind of interface you want to around the exploit components themselves. If you're writing a tool that verifies that whether you know, your host production system works correctly, that you have you know, firewalls working correctly, that anything you want to do to automatically run an exploit and get results back out of it, we've got a, prog a programmatic interface to it to be able to do this really easily, get results back. Um, the exploit and check routines actually return like real error codes that tell you whether the check failed and how it failed, the exploit succeeded, how it succeeded. So if you're building a system to automatically exploit anything, that you can actually recycle all five of the exploit components and either call it directly from Perl or write a wrap, push it around and call it from whatever language you like. Yeah, we're, uh, we're working on Metascript too, which is going to be like a, a more uh, friendly way of accessing the components um, just to do a very simple um, scripting type task if you want to, you know, auto script your. Yeah. Anyway, so um, MSFP scan is something that it's kind of it's kind of the uh, the runt stepchild of the Metasploit release, and that is not really part of the actual using the exploits and exploiting systems as it is as far as as much as to help the exploit development process. Um, as a lot of you are familiar, the, one of the hardest problems with Win32 exploits is finding reliable return address that will work on multiple platforms doing configurations. Yeah, I had a great talk this morning. I actually just caught the tail end of it, but pretty much they put a lot of effort into finding ways to automatically find these nice return addresses. Um, what MSFP scan does is actually a Perl script that will open up the actual like executable or DLL on the file system, parse through it, and actually disassemble the entire binary and figure out which instructions you land into and what the virtual address of the instructions are to use as a return address. Um, We've used this script so far to find universal return addresses for things like serve FTP. Um, our LSASS exploit doesn't have a target. You just run it, and it exploits it. Same goes with our DCOM exploits. If you start looking at some of the exploit code in the framework, you realize that we just don't really like having different targets. In other words, if you just want to set, you know, we want to see when you hit dot slash exploit, it figures out what it needs to do and lands on a universal return address, and you're done. So a lot of times with the, the one-shot exploits, you, you know, you really don't want to get the target wrong. Otherwise, you lose your chance to get in the system. Well, uh, one thing that MSFP scans different from a lot of the other stuff people are doing um, with like Ollie debug plugins and sort of uh, other techniques is that it's, it's completely offline. Everything we do is um, like we do it, we can do it on Linux or Windows, and it's just offline parsing the actual files, which can which has its advantages and disadvantages. But one thing that's cool is, for example, um, for the Serbia exploit, we had like eight installers from like version three through version like five something, right? So uh, you just script it, you do a cap extract, you pull all the DLLs out, you run through MSFP scan, you do correlation, we had a universal return address in like you know six minutes, which would have been a lot faster than going through actually installing Serbia, get it running, pulling images, image dumps, or doing emulation. Um, so it, I mean, obviously those techniques have a lot of just, a lot of more advantages, um, but this is cool just for the actual scripting abilities and the uh, the mass um, installer food. We also have a couple of helper utilities with the framework. Um, these are things that we found useful in one part of the exploit development process or another. Um, there's a tool that actually, if you run it with, under, arg with an argument of a file that comes with Windows, it'll actually go out and download the PDB files from Microsoft Symbol Server for you automatically. So if you're just assembling PDB files and otherwise you need to have the symbol information for whatever executable you're targeting, this can do it all for you without using the Windows debug interface at all. Um, one of the things we've really been pushing is trying to find uh, OS independent tools for doing Vuln Dev for Win32. Like, neither of us actually run Windows to do any of our development on. We refuse to. Almost all the exploit dev we do, almost all the Vuln research we do is done offline or you know, through VMware targets for the most part. Um, we rarely use all debug or WinDebug to find memory addresses. Almost all of it's done through tools like MSFP scan, which is actually used to populate things like the Opcode database. Um, some of the help utilities that we included with the framework are uh, an MSF payload utility. Any of the payloads that we've included with the Metasploit framework, you can actually extract out with this tool and put them into your own you know, .c exploit if you like to. Uh, if you just need shellcode real quick, real fast, you can use any of these utilities to generate anything we've currently included in the framework. Um, there's a CGI version of it you can find on the Metasploit.com website. And there's a command line payload encoder that uses any of the crazy encoding systems we already have to be able to encode a given payload you know, through you know, D-word additive feedback XOR dynamically created whatever this guy came up with. It's insane. So um, one of the nice things with the framework is that we've got built-in logging support for just about everything. And the log files are stored uh, timestamp by packet. So if you're doing a penetration test, you need to know exactly what time you are MRF on someone's server. You can actually go through and uh, you know run MSF log down, but it colorizes the output all nice for you with uh, you know the system output done in blue and your output done in red. And you can actually build you know nice partitioning tools for that to be able to do session replays and et cetera, whatever commands you ram. And finally, with the 2.2 release, we actually provided an online update utility, so you no longer have to keep browsing the website and hopefully actually release the module. You can actually just do MSF update-u and it'll pull down the latest exploit modules, and uh, you know you'll be happy.
Yeah, and that is SSL, and we check the SSL cert, so don't get too many ideas. Um, it's an attempt at being a secure update system. Um, and also, just, <laughs> just a quick talk about like MSF payload and MSF encode. Um, if for some reason you have to write like a .c exploit, um, this is just really nice and really quick. You can just set, pick a payload, like set up the options, say you want to bind port on port, like one, two, uh, port one, two, three, four, five, and you can run it through MSF encode, pick an encoder and say like, you know, avoid these list of bad characters, and it spits it out in a nice little blob for you that's ready to paste right into C, you know, char shell code. So, um, yeah. So, a uh, quick summary, the, uh, it's a stable exploit development uh, platform. It's designed to use uh, from both developer perspective and from the pen test actual uh, using perspective. Um, a lot of admins use it to verify scan results. And uh, our big thing is that we're focused on technology, not money, not the latest, greatest O'Day. Um, we really just want to go through and you know, break down everything into pieces and you know, try, to, try to do the best we can on each little piece and fit everything back together. One of the biggest reasons why we started working on this project is we just got absolutely sick of watching these crappy exploits show up in PacketStorm. I'm sure most of you are aware that almost anything you see landing on bug track, landing on PacketStorm, C and Honker, all the websites out there are just almost useless the way they're written. If you want to go through and forget how they actually work, how the vulnerability works, you know, how to write an IDS signature to it, um, otherwise actually use this code, you have to spend, you know, half your time with the, you know, what the programmer is trying to do in the first place, let alone why their code doesn't work right or why it's seg faults when you don't get a certain argument. Um, what we've really been trying to do with the framework is actually write exploits in a way that not only are they easy to use, easy to actually describe what the vulnerability is in the first place. So by actually analyzing the source code of all of our you know, plugins, we tend to have a lot of comments about how the vulnerabilities themselves work. And it can just be educational just to go through and see how a given bug actually works and affects the system. Nice about the way we do exploits is that like, usually most our exploits are more like metadata than they are actually uh, exploit code. We have a lot of information, you know, like setting you know, what platforms it supports and all, all that sort of thing parsing command line arguments, worrying about this, worrying about that, you know, so like, like C exploits are really hard to actually like get down to like what's the bug and how are you like exploiting it. So our code, like we, we don't have to worry like, you know, here's the bug, here, here's, where, here's how we're exploiting it. Um, so the exploit technology, um, like we were saying before, we have interchangeable payloads, um, you know, reverse, uh, bind, find sock, um, maybe none of those will work, you can do an ex execute. Um, we have encrypted XOR command shells, and uh, we also um, somebody really crafted the command underscore payloads, and uh, basically what those are they're for um, command injection vulnerabilities. So when you're not actually running shell code, you're just ability to run a command. Um, we have these command underscore like Unix reverse, which will do like telnet piping and connect back to you, and it feels like you're you know owning the box. You're not doing like you know double w get something ghetto. So we actually went through the time and like to to get the good commands and like, you know, build up uh, an abstraction so that it's really easy to, you know, um, to actually, you know, do powerful things with uh, command injection exploits. One of the nice about those exploits is if you have exploits like the PHP command injection ones, like the pass-through stuff, um, the source SF, SM and debug, the LPD command execution bugs, Usually, uh, a lot of them won't actually show you the payload, the command, the execution output. So if you run a command, you won't be able to see the output of the command due to the way that you know that the vulnerability works. Um, what we've done is the way that we've abstracted those is that we actually have pretty much the exact same payloads as command shells as we do as shell code. So like you know, like Spoon was saying, if you have a reverse connect payload, you've got one that's actually just executes telnet pipe shell pipe telnet and actually makes two connections back to the console that listens for two different connections, accepts both of them, figure out, figures out which one's input, and drops you a command shell that's completely consistent with everything else in the framework. It's actually really ugly to do, which is nice. We have the handler stuff, we can just do it once, because a lot of the stuff we have like, you know, double reverse telnet piping ninja foo, and it's a big headache. So if you, if you want to sit there with two netcats and try to do it, uh, I think this is better. One of the nice features about the way we design the framework is every single component of the framework that uses sockets of any form, shape, or you know, flavor, I guess, um, have integrated SSL support and proxy support. Um, the, we've abstracted the Perl I.O. classes and created our own wrapper classes around them. Um, just by setting like the force SSL environment option, even if you're using an exploit that previously didn't have support for SSL connections, you can actually force all TCP connections made by that exploit code to be SSL anyways. Another nice thing about it is you can say, uh, I've got this HTTP proxy, and then this other SOX proxy, and this or other HTTP them. proxy, yeah. or you know, 1,200 proxies in a row, and I should be able to provide those as an environment variable that'll cause every TCP connection to be cycled through with your entire proxy chain in the order you specify. We've actually tested this out with over 500 proxies in a chain at once, and actually had it work. So, I mean, <laughs> granted, it took five minutes for the data to go through all these proxies to get to the server, <laughs> but it'd probably be pretty hard to trace, so. 
And one of the nice things is after, we're working on some payloads now with, with the Meterpreter component and some of the Unix-based exploits that will actually fork off a proxy server, whether it's going to be a custom protocol or based on SOX, we haven't decided yet. Uh -oh. um, someone bumped something. I anyway, keep talking. <laughs> okay. And one of the things we're working on now is being able to pivot our exploits through this proxy server that we install as the payload of another exploit. So, for instance, you have a you know a web server that you're breaking into, and your web server will do a reverse connect shell. The reverse connect will come back to you, and you're going to use the DL injection techniques we're about to talk about to install a proxy server on that forwarded shell itself through one of the channeling systems inside the the interpreter we wrote for it. You can then you know create a local listener that pipes through that channel that then allows you to exploit systems behind the firewall and whatnot. So it's not so much syscall proxying in the sense that core you know core ST and um, Immunity Canvas is trying to do as much as it is just being able to use you know technologies already out there and kind of putting them together in a row. So um, it's really easy to add new protocols. If you have a custom protocol you want to um, add for proxying a request from one server to another, like say you want to re relay web requests for your exploit through like the UPnP protocol by sending UDP datagrams to the port that you know follows the notify request or something, you can actually create your own proxy code that will actually cause it to do that whenever a connection is being made, and then just define an environment variable that triggers that condition to happen. Uh, another cool thing about the way we abstracted the uh, the socket library is, for example, um, you know we have a bunch of UDP payloads, and you know originally we didn't have our own uh, our own code to do like you know raw raw UDP socket stuff, but eventually we got it added, and now we just have one um, environmental variable that you can set, and you can say UDP source IP, and it'll automatically switch down to using raw sockets and spoof the IP of all UDP packets throughout the framework. So it's not like you have to go through and backport all these changes into your exploit, like well oh, now I have to go back and support you know. Uh, you know, UDP spoofing for this exploit. Like the way it works, we can just go through and add it after the fact, and you know everything sort of follows along. And one of the nicest things about spoofing UDP packets and using broadcast addresses with some of the UDP exploits is, in combination with some other tools like the socket engine stuff for multiplexing command shells, um, you can actually hit a broadcast address and then watch hundreds of shells pop back in. So yeah. depending on the size of the client network, it's pretty amazing going to just a random client network, sending out like say the Black Ice or SQL Server exploit, and watching 50 servers all connect back to you. Yeah, this wireless is on a class A, so if you just want to send your exploits to 10.255.255. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not that we're uh, you know uh, <laughs> wasn't us. Um, so uh, I, more about technology. Um, IDS evasion. We have a uh, we have polymo polymorphic encoders and ops. Um, obviously, you know we're not just part of what we do is we're not just you know a, a OX90 NOPS led. It's pretty lame. So, like, you know, we, we sat down and worked on making like a good, a good NOPS led generator, and we can still make a lot of improvements on it. But that's at least like fairly random, and you can just set it for any exploit with the random NOPS uh, environmental variable. We also have uh, a polymorphic engine and a uh, polymorphic encoder that does additive feedback, so you can uh, avoid your uh, XOR analysis IDS IDSs. Um, and uh, I guess we spent a lot of time on like encoder and knob tech and stuff like that, and it all just sort of happens behind the scene and magic, um, but it works really well, and uh, is light years ahead of the defensive techniques. Um, avoid signatures with exploit options. A lot of time just happened that the way sort of Metasploit gets you into the mindset of writing exploits, it's really easy to add advanced options, really easy to do a bunch of stuff. So it happens after the fact, like one day me and HD sat down, we're like, huh, well, let's try to see how, you know, how Snort hand holds up to some stuff. And I was like, okay, we look at this signature. I'm like, oh, we, we can beat that if we set this option. And sure enough, like, you know, you go set one advanced option in an exploit and Snort has like no idea what's going on. Um, we also did some, uh, HD did some work with uh, first exit event masking. Basically, the way um, Snort used to work is that it was. they never actually rolled into a stable release. Okay, so but the way Snort works in any stable release is they fixed it in CVS, but is that it'll match the um, it'll match the alert with the longest signature. So, like you know, we do things like decom with like you know a cross-site scripting tag stuck in the middle of the payload, and Snort would say like cross-site scripting, and we'd have a shell in your box. Um, and multi-stage payloads can avoid signatures really easy. We can do you know multi-encoding. It's initial stage. Um, you know what I mean, stuff like that. Um, also, uh, just another sort of like the metasploit mindset is, uh, for example, when HD wrote the DCE RPC SMB library, we have a uh, pro implementation of it. Um, one of the options in the, um, in the SMB protocol is you can do fragmentation actually on the application level. Um, this is something that I don't think Core or Immunity has options to do. Um, 
But we have in both of our, uh, like in DCOM and LSASS, you just have a frag size. And uh, you can set it to one, which we'll probably show you later. And, and then what it will actually do is, um, in the application level, it'll fragment your request across you know, one, uh, one character per um, packet. So basically, we can do DCOM. Um, 8,000 packets, 15 minutes later, um, but it's an IDS nightmare. Like, the IDS really can't buffer enough data for a 15 minute long connection to be able to track that exploit, even if it didn't do application reassembling. Yeah. So, it, was one, it was one thing to try to do TCP reassembling and all those problems, but now if you have an application level, if you have an IDS that has like, you know, enough power to actually do SMB, you know, fragmentation reassembly, um, not really there yet. Um, one of the biggest problems we've run into when we're designing an exploit framework in Perl is that a lot of the libraries we need to handle different types of protocols just aren't there. Um, for instance, there's the PySMB library, which has been used by almost everyone who does a payload or an exploit framework in Python. It provides uh, access to the SMB protocol, the NetBIOS functions, interacting with Windows, CIFS shares, etc. Um, we needed that for the LSSS exploit because it does DC RPC over an SMB pipe. So we just wrote it. We sat down and pumped out, you know, 5,000 lines of code to do an SMB class, and now we've got our own little mini Samba as part of MSF implemented from scratch. So that's kind of the mindset we've been taking with a lot of the stuff. We realized that these components can be reused for even non-security purposes, and we really want to just, you know, if we're writing the code anyways for an exploit framework, we might as well have it usable enough that someone else can use the code. So you'll probably see the, that's the SMB stack and the DCRPC stack start becoming, you know, used in other exploits or other tools just because we've already done all the work up front on it. Um, we tend to write them whenever we need them. Um, when we're doing MSSQL testing, for instance, we built an entire library for doing version requests for, you know, doing login attempts, things like that. And we'll probably continue to do the same thing for things like XDR encoding for all the RPC exploits we plan on adding in the near future. Uh, and also, just um, the difference between using a already existent SMB library and writing our own is that if we went out and grabbed some SMB library, it probably would have been written from the actual like using it normally perspective. Whereas when we write it, we use it from like you know using it abusively perspective. So you may have libraries that don't allow you to do certain things, things out of order, you know, protocol munging, um, weirdness. You may actually end up having to like battle with a library to actually get it to do what you want. Whereas when we write it, we try to make it you know very open and just sort of like you know that allowing you to do hackery with it. Um, so that's, I guess that's a big difference between a lot of like, rewriting some libraries or basing it on uh, public code. Um, so Windows Remote DLL, only inject, DLL injection is uh, a really big thing that we're releasing in 2.2. Um, and that's probably why a lot of you are here. So um, what it is is it's in-process, in-memory DLL injection. Um, does not write any files to disk. Um, everything stays in memory. And uh, it allows you to just write an arbitrary DLL in you know, Visual Studio or something, compile it down, and then just in any exploit, throw this DLL in the, uh, in the Windows process. And it starts it up, and it makes uh, things really, really easy, which we'll show you later. Uh, it was written by Jarko um, and Scape, uh, Matt Miller. And they put a lot of work into that. And Scape is one of our developers. Um, has another great thing about doing DLL injections, you have the full access to the Windows API. So if you want to do, you know, SSL or you want to do crypto over your own channel, you can just like, you know, reach into the Windows API and back on some of their stuff. If you want to download a file, I mean, this is a lot of stuff that was, the Windows API access is really painful um, to do from shell code, especially if you have to do a lot of it. This way, you know, you're just writing it as if you're writing a normal Windows application. Um, it's really easy to back on, um, it's really easy to convert a C, C++ to a payload, and it's also really easy to use existing code. For example, we have a real VNC DLL that you'll be seeing later, and it was very easy just to pull, you know, an established open source project and uh, stick it into a DLL and have fun. It's a quick thing about the DLL injection. That actually executes as a new thread inside the exploited process. So if we inject, you know, say VNC or any other type of, you know, custom code into the exploited process, you're not going to see anything in the process list to give you an idea that anything happened. In other words, if you go into Process Explorer, the task list, all you see is LSASS and maybe one new thread if you're paying attention. You won't see any other process on the task list. The antivirus systems won't be able to detect anything being written to disk because they tend to do scanning on access. We're seeing more AV systems actually trying to detect like malware and exploits now to work around things like, you know, worm infections and whatnot or, you know, things like iscrack.dll being written or hk.exe being written. There's a lot of pinterest have seen. You copy these files to a system, you try to run them, and then all of a sudden it's gone again, the antivirus deleted from, from the system you're trying to break into. So it drives people nuts when they're trying to do a pen test and an AV system is constantly deleting their malware. So this is a technique where you can do it remotely in memory without ever triggering the, the you know, antivirus system in the first place. Because of the antivirus problem, 
the person who developed the code originally was kind of hesitant to release it publicly because they're worried that a worm would actually start using this to bypass every single AV system in existence. And, you know, it could be possible, but it's also a 3,000 byte payload that we have to use the state system for loading in the first place. So the ability to just drop it into some other hostile code and making the mobile code is, it's there, but we're not expecting to have it anytime soon. Um, and another important thing is that instead of, you know, just uploading code and then doing like a uh, create process and execute or something, is that with the DLL injection, you are staying and keeping the original process intact. So say you own LSASS and maybe you can write some DLL to pull secrets out of LSASS. Um, you know, maybe that's more useful than actually getting a command shell. Um, just stuff like that. So, um, yeah. The nice thing about the VNC server and the way we implemented it is that it used the same socket as the original payload connection. If you use a bind, a bind shell connection in your exploit, it'll then connect to the server and then do the stage loading across that. And when it's done, the VNC server will be proxied across the same, the same original connection. It's not like it just opens up port 5900 in the box, you have to connect to that. So as long as you have one payload system for getting a socket through that firewall in the first place, you've got a way to connect to VNC and the desktop regardless of how they're configured. Right, so if you do a fine sock or something, you can pump down stuff. And we'll talk about Metropolis later, which does a lot of really cool stuff with that. One of the cool things about the way we implemented VNC as well is that if no one is logged onto the system, well, you usually have the problem, well, you're sitting in a, you know, a control alt delete prompt of VNC saying, okay, now I need to log in to log in the box. Well, the thing is, you already have system access. You already have access enough of whatever process you exploited that you can just make your own command shell. So what we do is we'll actually we'll find whatever the interactive desktop is, whether it's the win logon desktop or the login screen, or it's an actual interactive user, and we drop a command shell that's all, you know, pretty colors of blue and white and whatnot on top of it that runs the system. So you can actually go to a system that has nobody logged into it whatsoever, just a control delete prompt, type the word explore into the little command pop that pops up, and have a complete working desktop on a desktop that has the logon screen on it still. It's pretty bizarre. So if someone walks up to this terminal, they're sitting there looking at somebody working on, a system, working on the system as a system user account with a, with a please log in message in the background still. Yeah. So I'll show you a demo. It's pretty funny to look at, and it tends to really confuse users. It, uh, <laughs> it works for locked workstations, too. And it's nice, because like XP has that nice login screen. So you have that nice login screen with the start bar. Kind of looks um, like your desktop background when you're done. So. <laughs> um, so the interpreter is something that isn't released yet, and we're still working on it. It's not quite there yet. Um, it's a custom shell written as a DLL payload. Basically, you'd use DLL injection and have this really advanced system. Um, it does connection multiplexing, which is stuff that we've been preaching but didn't have the infrastructure to do it for a while. So now, you know, you own something with a fine sock. Now you can open a command remotely and, you know, have a new logical connection. It's still all going over the other connection. You can have 10 command shells going at multiplexing. You can throw SSL on the tunnel. So now, you know, just go to the Windows API, ask for an SSL connection, 10 command shells, all multiplexed, all beautiful. And then actually, a lot of it is uh, very working. Um, we just have a lot of integration and little things to do with it. So hopefully that'll be in 2.3. Um, you can dynamically load new extensions. Um, so you can just write an uh, interpreter DLL. Um, it will do another in-process load over the net. So you can just say, you know, in interpreter, you can say, like, you know, my local DLL, which does, you know, some fancy something. Um, Built-in cryptography support, uh, like I said. And uh, it's written by Scape. And we're all starting to work in integration and uh, just also feature set and stuff like that with it. It's, it's really like going to change things a lot. It's really going to be pretty amazing. The dynamic extension loading system allows you to do things like privilege escalation without actually having to modify the core code. So for instance, you have the interpreter stuff installed in your system, and you use that as your payload for your exploit. Well, you break into a box that you know, has been patched up to the latest Microsoft, you know, whatever the latest Microsoft vulnerability is. You can then say, OK, well, I can get system access if I only had you know, a you know, like the recent POSIX vulnerability. If you can write an exploit for the POSIX subsystem, you get a command shell system versus the other one. Well, instead of actually spawning an external command shell and going through all these hoops, I forgot how to get a, a system command shell on the box that you already have, you know, a command shell running on, or the interpreter running on, you can just write, you rewrite the exploit to work as a DLL, change the init routine for the most part, and be able to, you know, open process, adjust privilege tokens, and otherwise, and person, yeah. Anyways, there's uh, different ways you can programmatically do privilege escalation exploits as external modules for the system and load them as you need them. So, um, yeah, another thing, since this is just another DLL, um, you can really easily take, you know, like the POSIX Windows C executable and just drop it in um, into the DLL, do a couple little things, and you'd have, like, you know, someone else's built um, privilege escalation exploit written, and then you can just load it over through the interpreter and it's. And the right. dynamic load extensions are still not written to disk. So, the AV right. vendors are just kind of SOL in this case. Everything's in process. And we also have some. Uh, 
some fancy food going on for anti-forensics technique besides just the SSL and stuff. Um, for example, you can use a module to do uh, like virtual protect or whatever the API would call is, but basically to prevent your memory space from getting swapped to disk. And then, um, uh, yeah, so that's one thing. And then, uh, yeah, I was going somewhere else with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got demos coming up, so hopefully we can roll with those and still have some time left. And we decided to do all our demos on Mac OS X just because we've already got the slides running on it, so why not? Then and it sort of demonstrates the, uh, the leetness of it all. <laughs> the cross-platform compatibility. The so. three primary platforms we test on right now are Mac OS X, Win32, and Linux. But we've, had, we've been able to drop in and run the framework on everything from old versions of HPOX to Solaris to AIX to just about everything that was, everything that was a Perl interpreter. Um, once in a while, we need to install like a, a custom build version of Perl just because whatever the system provides isn't enough. But for the most part, it's compatible with just about everything that will run Perl, which is just about every modern OS these days. Um, we actually have a copy of Metasploit running on the Zorus right now. So you could just be you know, walking around an office building with your little Zorus just hacking away. And it can do everything from VNC to DLL injection, everything just on your Zorus. And with a little Wi-Fi card and you know, an evil intent, pretty dangerous. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I remember what I was going to say about the uh, interpreter anti-forensic stuff. Um, besides preventing the uh, interpreter stuff from getting swapped. Um, damn it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, if, no. <laughs> I keep on losing my train of thought as like trying to uh, mentally do the demos in my head. Um, oh, he also has a, uh, an anti-debugging um, extension where it actually will do um, some nice interesting things to prevent anyone from debugging the process after you own it. So not only is you not getting swapped to disk, um, you'd really have to write a custom piece of software to go into the process and figure out anything's going on. You can't debug it at all using the Windows debugging API. You can use like soft ice or something, or you could do some like manual memory read calls into the process, but it's really like, you know, light years ahead in that sort of aspect. So I'm hoping this font's actually readable. Um, I'm sure everyone in the back has absolutely no idea what's on the screen right now, so let me try to bring this up a little bit. All right. Um, so you can see this Windows 2000 target on the right here. Uh, this is going to be our owning machine, and this is going to be our owned machine. Um, and we'll probably switch them back and forth. But so we do a couple different demos, you know, owning Linux, owning Windows, you know, Linux owning Windows, Windows owning Linux, um, <laughs> OS X owning. It's really just a big mishmash of root shells. So. So we pretty much have every single system being able to own the other system at some point, so it works out okay. Um, I know, only one system and using that to own. But you probably realize that I'm not actually familiar with OSX. We just use it as kind of the, the target box to throw things at. So hopefully this will just going to work out. Um, when you start with the, the MSF console, the first thing you'll see is, you know, how many exploits are loaded, how many payloads are loaded, and this little MSF prompt. Um, usually, you know, if you're not sure what's currently installed and you like show exploits, and it does like, you know, tab completions, we get tab and shows, you know, encoders, exploits, exploits. And there's a whole bunch of them. So, yeah. so this is just go general overview of stuff. The first demo we're going to do is the uh, subversion server and kind of demonstrate some of the capabilities of the, the Linux payloads, doing things like using the impurity system, which we didn't really talk about today, but it's sort of akin to the DLL injection, but for Linux versions, you can actually inject an alpha executable into the memory of the process you exploit. The nice thing about that is if the process you're exploiting is, say, you rooted into, you know, locked into a true jail, isn't running as root, you've got no way to break out of it, but it still has a file descriptor open to some other file in the system, using the impurity demo shell we have, you can actually read and write to that file descriptor from your payload. So in other words, you don't lose anything. You know, instead of just doing an exact thing and losing access to all these file scripters, it gives you a shell where you can do all these different things, read, write files, create things, and kind of get you know, internal access to the process you broke into as opposed to just spawning off a shell and losing all the capabilities. Right. So an example of that would be, say, you owned like Vine or something, and it was CH-rooted, um, which you know, you can't really do much. Uh, that was like a kernel local or something like that, which also Impurity um, does well. But, you could then, you know, take over the open socket listening on port 53 or something and now, you know, do be your own DNS or something like that. So it's staying in process and it's really just uh, an easy way to do a lot of uh, cool stuff like that. And you, again, you're just writing your exploits as a C and there's some uh, special linker scripts to build it in the special uh, impurity format and then you just point it to the executable and magic happens. I'm trying to find a place to put the microphone where I'm not killing you guys in the ears every time I move it. So, um, what I just did is I to load an exploit in the framework. You just do use space the name of the exploit module. It does tab completion, so you can do use IAS tab tab tab. It gives you just a list of exploits that affect IAS. 
Um, in the near future, we have the ability to be able to do, you know, be, to do select exploits and display them based on keywords. So you can say, I want to, you know, show me everything that can break into this type of server. That Win32 SQL Server it happens to be, and I'll show them all to you. Right, uh, right now, there's a lot of metadata in the exploits, um, saying like what platforms they support. You know, you can add stuff like, you know, this is an IIS exploit and stuff like that. Right now, um, it would be really easy to add, you know, GTK. Exploit. We can automatically generate the trees based on architecture, based on operating systems, stuff like that. So you have a very easy, you know, um, something that look more commercial and more clean where you can just say, you know, give me the Windows exploits. Okay, something that hits IIS, you know, or search for, you know, subversion or something like that. I'll just do a full text, full text search through the metadata. Um, we try to, try to make really good descriptions and different um, notes in all of our exploits. We give references to, um, you know, OSVDB for the bug information and anything that we found useful in the development process, uh, you know, Maybe some post where some guy, you know, really went beyond um, what the advisor did and stuff like that. So right now he's just setting some environment options, um, the remote host uh, to connect to. Um, you can see that those are the options that are required and what he's filling in. Um, do you have some version? Instead of doing SVN server, I'm going to do Samba real quick just because I've got the path I set in this image. So apologies. Uh, yeah, so it's all pretty similar. So um, you can just see use use exploit. So we're going to use Samba trans to open um, set the uh, there's tab completion for stuff like IP addresses and stuff like that, which is uh, useful. It gets kind of confusing. You have more than one IP though. So right now it's defaulting to the wrong interface, which we should probably turn off in case anyone's <laughs> curious out there. So do do do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, we're the only one with the AFP exploit working, so <laughs> we're safe. Yeah, this uh, laptop is probably about as vulnerable as Mac can get, so the, problem is, the funny thing is there's no exploits for it anyway. It's, no one's really got around this old double data iCache thing and done it well yet. So uh, what will we do we'll have an exploit for it, and we'll own it in a second, so. So, also, is there anybody have any questions about stuff while we're sort of preparing the demo? Um, sort of narrate as he types. Um, you can see that there's a lot of just different options. Um, show targets, set a target, set a payload, set the options up, um, you know, Linux target, um, save the environment to disk, export it. Um, nice. I we need a payload that wasn't written three days ago. <laughs> oh, whatever, fine receipt works. <laughs> So here it's uh, doing a brute force attack on the Zomba server. And connection, bam, done. And just about all the exploits work pretty quick, pretty fast. And this will work on BSD, Linux, et cetera. Um, the list of the payloads we showed a second ago, like, this is just a default reverse connect shell. As you see, you know, we've got a command shell. It's not that interesting. We've got a root, you know, et cetera. But if we want to do anything else in the box, we'll probably have to install some, system, install some uh, you know, utilities on it, otherwise set it up to do whatever we feel like doing with the system. Um, so by setting the payload to be the impurity injection stuff, we can show you know all the file descriptors Samba has open, kind of get an idea of what the process can do. Just hitting tab, you can see that the available um, the exploit will auto automatically match to the different payloads uh, available. So you can see that there's both BSD and Linux payloads um, since we support both. So then you know we can do something like a uh, reverse impurity, which is going to do now. Um, and then when you use this option, when you say show options, which you were looking at before, you misspelled. Um, I sure did. Uh, it'll show the uh, the options specific to that payload. So now on the bottom you'll see that it says payload, and these are the options that are specific to that payload. So we're going to do an impurity. Um, why don't you clip on the mic? It keeps falling off, actually. So. Do you want my mic? Okay. okay. So um, we're going to upload a uh, an elf image um, and run it on the uh, system. So. Yeah, it's a Mac. <laughs> we don't usually use it, um, but uh, we've had interesting computer problems this weekend. So uh, we're just going to use the uh, the shell demo. Um, you can see that set just shows you the environment options that are set. Um, show options will show everything, and now start filling in the options that we filled in. Uh, Linux target, you know, uh, impurity with that executable. Go ahead and exploit it. Um, and now uh, it's reverse, so we're going to reverse connection, automatically do the staging, and uh, upload the, uh, 
the impurity executable, if, if it works. There's like this, you know, think we made mad. magic demo juju where nothing, everything always works, except for when you do a demo and then it doesn't work. So uh, huh. maybe it's just ha unhappy because we've been owning it too much today. Yeah, but. I think this whole box is going to hit. Whoa. <laughs> Could be an encoder too. No, it's never the encoders. All right, so um, yeah, this isn't too interesting. Normally would work. You can try, try setting a different encoder for it. Okay, switch. So now I'll just uh, simply say like you're gonna fall off. So I'll say set encoder, and I can set like you know uh, a different encoder. Um, and spell it right. And. Uh, Something slightly different about the way we did the exploit framework as opposed to other people is we actually have like tons of redundant encoders that all do things in a slightly different way. Um, it tends to. Samba. Excuse me? Samba it should. I'm not going to restart in this case. Excuse yeah, me? I know. All right, try it. But I mean, okay. <laughs> you did about the exploits, so I don't know. But yeah, blame it on <laughs> Anyway, uh, we do want to talk about some other things. Um, for example, we could use this and do uh, an inline egg payload. The, uh, the exploit matching to uh, payload stuff all happens dynamically. So we'll do things like, you know, if a payload's too, sm or too big, it won't work. Or, you know, if it has, you know, some sort of, OK, so now it worked. Um, we withhold our comments. So this is actually. Thanks for the tip. You get a free ninja. You yeah. got some ninjas on the table here, and you get a ninja. So. Where is he? There he is. Where is he? Uh, back that way. Oh shit. <laughs> oh. Uh. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Uh, so anyway, uh, this is actually just a, uh, an alpha executable uh, reading and talking over standard in. We could just run it on a Linux box, and it would give you the same sort of work. So um, so now you know you can do a help, and it's just a small C program, um, and you know LSFD will. List the open file descriptors, and you can see you get, you know, rad information and stuff like that. And you could take this to a much farther level. Um, a lot of different things. So, um, anything else you want to share with that? Uh, Linux stuff is kind of big. Do you have, what's payload size in there? Can I do in my in my ink? Excellent. Yeah, we could we need to enable Python now. Oh, yeah. So uh, we can enable Python payloads uh, just by setting enable Python. Um, and then uh, we can do an inline egg payload doing a, an X or reverse shell. We'll show that quick. It probably won't do just justice without a uh, like a um, without a uh, sniffer on the line. But I mean, it is XORD, so yeah. So now we've uh, enabled Python support, which we uh, removed by default for speed and a lot of other reasons, and probably licensing. Um, those inline egg guys are kind of <laughs> weird about that, so uh, we can't get a real license out of them. So. But we include it, so we haven't got sued yet. <laughs> yeah, we actually sent about six emails to Core ST asking what the real license of uh, inline egg was, and it's hard to really get a straight answer about what we can and what we can't do with it. So it's in there right now. It's sealed by default that they ask for remove it. No yeah. one seems to be using it anyways, and it's a huge speed improvement not to load it. So yeah, uh, especially on Windows, there was a lot of if people noticed the older versions were pretty slow using on Windows, just especially in between commands and stuff. Because we're loading a lot of the uh, the different components. A lot of that was because I had to reach out and do all the external Python stuff. You know, I think so they actually removed it from the OS X version that I have on here. So oh, all right. Speed. Well, okay. Um, so on Windows. Sure. Sounds good. All right. Um, this is our OS X exploit. Um, this bug came out in sometime in what March or something like that. Whatever Cansec was. Yeah. Um, we actually, this is another thing of like, you know, the Metasploit mindset. We didn't really get around to writing analysis ASS for a while because we needed a, an SMB stack and stuff like that. And instead of just sort of doing, you know, we had a lot of people sending us dot C's of like hard coded, you know, strings that we could have done and we could have written an exploit and it would have worked, but we kind of wanted to do it the right way. So instead we put our efforts in writing a, uh, an SMB library and then once that was done, writing this, uh, 